So um, uh, we have um, uh, uh, Shazia Ganai from uh, uh, NeuroInsight, one of the leading um, uh, uh, neuroscience firms directed towards market research and, uh, and has done a series of really ex interesting uh, uh, experiments about attention and media. So I'm going to hand over to, to, to Shazia. Thanks, Mike. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. It's just really weird. You can't really tell if anyone can hear you when you're wearing this. Thank you for being here. It's really bizarre being in front of an actual audience again for the first time in so long. It's really nice to kind of get the energy back because we've gotten a bit used to doing this in front of a screen. So today I'm going to be talking about attention, but from the point of view of our subconscious mind. So I'm the CEO of NeuroInsight. Um, and we're a company that specializes in measuring electrical brain activity to give us a little insight into the, the seat of all human decision making. Because about 80 to 90% of our decisions actually happen in our subconscious. And I'm sure that everyone's a bit bored of seeing this stat. It kind of comes up a lot, but it's a really relevant one. And I like to remind audiences all the time that, you know, a lot of our decision making happens in our subconscious. And particularly when we talk about attention, we often think of it as a very conscious thing, but there are layers to how attention works. And I want to talk a bit about that today. So when I was thinking about what to say today, luckily, just sheer dumb luck, um, Adam Grant, who I'm a fan of, anyone who's in the space of psychology would be, he had a podcast episode where he was talking to John Green, who's a famous author who wrote The Fault in Our Stars. And he, he had this amazing quote, which says, what you pay attention to matters, but maybe what matters most is the kind of attention you pay. And I think in marketing, we don't often talk about the type of attention. We kind of throw the word attention around all the time. And actually, Mike and I had a really interesting conversation yesterday about this, and, and it, it really uh, fits in with a lot of what I have to say. We talk about grabbing attention and the term grabbing being quite physical, and I do talk a little bit about that um, later on. But before I get into the nitty gritty of attention and show you some fun case studies, because that's what we do, us researchers, I'll tell you a little bit first about the brain and how it works, because I think it's important to set that context. So the first thing to note, annoyingly, is that our brains actually don't care about brands at all. Um, our whole world is constructed through stories. So. Um, there's a part of your brain at the front called the orbitofrontal cortex, which develops when you're in your teens. So when you're a kid, you believe in Santa and the tooth fairy and loads of other random crap that isn't real because our brains are effectively open so that we can learn. Then as we grow up and our brain develops, this bit comes into play so that we can assess risk. It helps us to understand the threats in front of us and also unfortunately then acts as kind of a human ad blocker because it doesn't like a hard sell. And so what we're looking for really is stories. That's what captures our attention, not those kind of price-led heavy messages of a sale or promotion. I think that's what we often were taught back in the day and even are told now is what captures attention. The other thing is that our brains seek human connection and relevance. And I don't think we've, you know, we really understood this fully until the past sort of 18 months when we were starved of some of that human connection in a way we've never experienced before. We saw the magnitude of how much this matters. And this does play into marketing effectiveness and attention as well. The third thing is that our memories are colored by emotion. Anyone who's seen me speak before will see me reference the Disney film Inside Out. It's a great film for anyone who hasn't watched it, whether you have kids or not, definitely watch it. Um, but they had neuroscientists involved in the creation of that film because the analogy is real. So there's a little girl in the film and they show these little characters inside her brain and they're different colors depending on the type of emotion that they represent. And that's because from an evolutionary point of view, our brains have evolved to encode all of our memories alongside an associated emotion. And that's really important for our survival. And then lastly, to build on that, our brain builds by association. So the information that you take in about any brand, something that does capture your attention, anything that's related to that, your brain will build up inventory and associations around those brands. So that's a little bit about the brain, just to give you a bit of context. 
So I'm going to tell you a bit about how we measure it and then what that actually looks like in terms of a few case studies that showcase attention. So we measure electrical brain activity using a technology called SST or steady state topography. It was invented by a very cool neuroscience professor who's based out in Australia and is the founder of our business. He's still very much involved in the business, but he's currently doing some weird academic work studying telepathy between twins. So I'm looking forward to reading about that once that's done. And when we measure the brain, we look at different regions of the brain. And I get asked so much about this buzzword attention. And whenever people ask me, I say, well, we've got a few metrics that talk about attention. It just goes to show that attention is not just one thing. So we measure what we call visual attention. And this is, as it sounds, it is how stimulated your primary and secondary visual cortex in the brain are. And so it's a, a type of attention that's really important. And I'll show you what some data looks like around visual attention. But then we also look at something called general attention, which is the parietal cortex, right? And this is actually associated with the grabbing stuff with your hand. So this is, I would say, more related to when we talk about grabbing attention, the physical movement of actually grabbing something. That's what this area of the brain is responsible for. And then thirdly, another type of attention that we measure is not called attention, but it's called long-term memory encoding. Now this is our key metric, and it's the thing that we talk about most at NeuroInsight. And it is a measure of the stuff that your brain thinks is important enough to pack away for good, and it correlates directly to future action, decision-making, and behavior change. So you've got three different types of attention there already, and, and that's, that's a simplistic way of looking at the brain, right? We have about 86 billion neurons in our brains, so there's quite a lot going on. We also look at a few other bits and pieces. So we look at engagement, an overused word in marketing actually means personal relevance in this case. We look at that pink one there, emotional intensity, which is a, an evolutionary mechanism of arousal. And then we look at that green one there, which is the direction of emotion. All of these play a role in attention, which just goes to show how complex and perhaps oversimplified the word attention has been. So I'm going to talk now about a few case studies and how this has come to life. So firstly, I want to talk about attention and action, because ultimately what brands are looking for is attention that drives action for their brands. And when we measure attention, sometimes it can be a bit, as I said, simplified. And so I'm going to show you a case study for this. Now, this is what we call a time series film. So when we run research at NeuroInsight, we get a bunch of people to come in a room. If we're testing a TV ad, we fit them with our headsets. And once they're done taking their selfies, they just hang out and watch half an hour of TV. And during that TV programming, we'll have some ads and they'll view those and we'll measure their brains. Simple as that. Now, we would have aggregated data across the sample. We have a minimum sample size of 50 people. So this is what one of those metrics would look like in terms of real-time, second-by-second data. Now, the chart there, I'm going to move away slightly from this mic. I don't know what that does to the sound. I'm sure you can still hear me. But this chart here is looking at visual attention. So that bit where I said it's your visual cortex and how stimulated that is. Along the bottom is time, up the side is strength of brain response. Now we measure visual attention in both the left and the right hemisphere because both are processing, both are important. The visual attention on the left is the visual attention to the detailed stuff and the visual attention on the right is the bigger picture stuff. Now there's two dotted lines on the chart. They're actually reference lines. What we're looking for is anything that goes above that top dotted line. That's where you've got high visual attention. That's where your brain is really kicking in hard. And I'm gonna play this ad for you and fingers crossed the sound works. The genius guys in the back have been trying to make my video work this morning. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what this means, so. Can you pass me that one? Can you recommend a sci-fi book for us? Yeah. Um, anything else? Uh, no, that'll do it. $20, Thank you very much. Okay. 
Okay, so what you can see there is there's quite a few peaks, you know, it goes above that top dotted line. There's a few moments where we've got quite high visual attention. They specifically tend to happen when you've got the four people together, the family, which is obviously the same woman shown four times. It's visually quite stimulating. And also at the point of branding, you've got high visual attention. So that's good, right? I mean, we want to see good visual attention. But as I said earlier, having high visual attention isn't the only thing that matters, right? Attention comes in different forms. And memory is the thing that we know drives future action and decision-making behavior change. Because if it isn't in your brain, you can't do anything with it. So in this instance, when we look at visual attention, but then we also look at the same ad when it comes to memory, you've got quite low levels of memory. So something that could be quite visually stimulating doesn't always indicate high memory. Now, in some cases, you get high levels of both. In other cases, you might get low levels of visual attention, but high levels of memory. I mean, it's not as simple as we perhaps think. And then to add to this, I have a lot of conversations with clients and, um, and also with competitors around the idea of emotion and the role that plays. And if something is super happy, does that not surely mean it's capturing attention? This is the chart that shows approach and withdrawal. So this is the measure of the direction of emotion in your brain. It's your brain literally going, do I want to lean towards this or back away? And we find that sometimes you get quite high levels of approach, but you get low memory. And that means it's basically entertaining, but you're not going to do anything with it. So something being super happy isn't always right. Actually taking people on the relevant emotional journey is what's really important. Um, we actually did some work a while back where we looked at Britain's Got Talent and we found that Simon Cowell elicited really like deep levels of withdrawal response, but high levels of memory. But Amanda Holden had quite high approach and low memory. And it was a shame because he actually stuck in the brain even though people disliked him but she was kind of forgettable and nice in the moment. So, you know, I think that there's a lot to be said for understanding the different metrics and the role that they play. The second point I want to talk about is seeing versus remembering, which kind of fits into this. And we did some work with Royal Mail where we looked at um, priming of one media on another. And it's quite important, I think, in this complex media landscape to not look at just one thing in isolation, but look at the relationships between them. And this is quite, takes up quite a lot of the work that we do with clients. With Royal Mail, we looked at when the brain was responding to social media advertising, and we know that different media play different roles. Some media can cause quite a high visual attention response because it's the kind of stuff where you're sort of scrolling quite quickly, and so that's the type of attention that your brain will need to give. And what we found is on brand campaigns where they were on social media, long-term memory was kind of low. The advertising was a bit intrusive, but the visual attention was quite high. We then looked at what happens when you prime with uh, direct mail. So the blue chart, the blue graphs there, the bars, sorry, they're for the responses when the content was seen on social media after it had been primed by direct mail, so physical mail, which we know is really engaging because it has a sense of personal relevance, you're touching it, etc. We saw that actually visual attention decreased. That's not a bad thing. Memory increased. It just meant that the way the attention was being paid was different, but it just goes to show that it doesn't necessarily mean there's a detriment to the action that's driven if one type of attention is low. I know Mike and I talk about this kind of stuff a lot because what Mike's amazing company does is measure eye tracking. And so they look at where the eyes go. And there's a big kind of complementary nature of what we do in that we're looking at what's being encoded and they're looking at what's being seen. And they often pair up really well, but sometimes what we remember may not be seen and what seen is not remembered. So work with both of us is the answer there. <laughs> and then the last bit I want to talk about is some amazing work that we did actually on uh, context, which was done with Magnetic Media, fantastic uh, group of individuals there. You'll be hearing from Anna a bit later on. So we conducted this study measuring brain response to magazine advertising. So we had a bunch of people come in and they read a lot of magazine titles and we were looking at understanding 
the sustained attention to advertising in the brain. One of the things that we found here, and, and context is really important, and we've done, uh, we've written a white paper on this, if anyone wants to check it out, feel free to download it from our website, is we found that magazine elicited a bit more of a right brain response. Now, this doesn't mean that you're not processing stuff on the left, because you're not either one thing or another. Your brain's busy doing a lot of stuff. But what we found was that actually there was more of a right brain response. Now, when we talk about the right brain metrics, we know that that's where we process kind of the bigger picture feel. I know in popular culture, it's the emotional side of the brain. That's not necessarily true um, because emotion is processed in various areas, but it is a bit more emotionally charged when it's on that side and it's a bit more big picture. And what we found here when we were looking at the data was this is looking at a combination of two of our metrics. So right brain memory response, which is again that big picture overall, uh, overall kind of feel of something, which we get a lot of where you've got bright colours and tones, which magazine really elicits sort of a lot of strong response to. And then emotional intensity. Now emotional intensity is a part of the back of our brains. It's a very visceral, instinctive response. It's actually an evolutionary mechanism of arousal and excitement. And we saw that when you combined it, magazine actually elicited a stronger response. So when we talk about attention, different media can play in different spaces and really leverage different types of attention. And so, I mean, I've said it about a hundred times, I think already, but it's the type of attention I think that matters. And we've kind of oversimplified the way that we talk about attention in the world today. So three thoughts to take away. One is, if you want to really understand attention, look deeper at the type of attention. And paying attention to something visually doesn't always mean it's going to drive action. And driving action doesn't always, you know, memory doesn't always equate to high visual attention and vice versa. Sometimes it can be superficial. So perhaps remembering is important as well. And context, context is so key to the type of attention that we pay. And also brands can really leverage which context matches which type of attention to go pretty far. So that's everything from me. Thank you. Shazia, thank you so much for that. That was that was fascinating, and I mean, what a strong start to the conference to have uh, uh, an economist and now a neuroscientist uh, uh, talk about. We only got one one time for um, we've got two two questions here. Um, the the first one uh, is um, uh, I love what you do. Have you, which is a good way to start thank any you, question, isn't it? Um, love what you do. <laughs> Um, uh, how have your attention measures uh, informed creative uh, development? Yes. Uh, so, and there's another question after that. So, yes. so there we okay. Are. So, we've done a, a ton of work in this space. Um, it's a lot of it's published. So, if anyone wants to check it out, please do Google uh, ThinkBox, Creative Drivers, Neuro Insight. We did a massive study looking at the drivers of effectiveness. Um, and I actually just submitted a piece to Walk about this exact subject on the Cannes uh, 2021 Effectiveness Winners. So when we look at that, we tend to put a lot of our focus on memory encoding because what memory tells us is how the brain is processing narrative. And the narrative is really, really important when it comes to creative effectiveness for brands in particular. I don't know if that answered the question at all. Please nod if it did. And then, and then one other... Um, uh, a quick question. Your sure. company also has offices in Australia, in London, yes. and, and America, and, uh, and many other uh, places. So, have you noticed any differences in response to advertising or, or yeah. attention patterns across the world? Yes, absolutely. So, whenever we speak to clients about this stuff, we always say that look, cultural context matters. The way that your brain is wired is it will encode stuff into its memory depending on the context around it. That will determine what your brain thinks is important enough to encode. So for example, we see that in terms of um, emotional response, so the polarity of emotion, our American colleagues always laugh at the fact that our approach withdrawal charts are slightly tamer than theirs. They're emotionally a lot more volatile. And I'm like, who's taking the piss out of who here? <laughs> Um, and the other thing that we've seen is even, uh, I remember we did a study ages ago which looked at Japanese women and their response in terms of emotion was so neutral. They had a completely neutral response and it is cultural conditioning 
you know, we, we, I think we talk about how much we're changing and how much the world's evolving, but the human brain hasn't actually evolved in its structure and function for a very, very long time. And there's some deeply ingrained conditioning that is the reason why there's certain barriers we can't cross. So I sit on the MRS Diversity and Inclusion Council. I do a lot of work with Core Colour Research, and I'm also in the Women in Research Exec team. And this is one of the things we're always battling is when we try and improve DNI, is everyone wants to be part of the dialogue, but our subconscious is controlling 80 to 90% of our decisions, and it is ingrained with those conditioned responses that are often the reason that it takes a while for these patterns to be broken. So yeah, I went a little bit beyond the question Brilliant. there. <laughs> well, thank you very much, guys. Thank you, everyone.